over here with the red cards. And when they wave at me, now you're just out of my line of sight, so you may have to really hop up and down to get my attention, but I will do my best to look over there. And we will uh, ask some questions that come from the internet. Now, I knew this was an extraordinary book uh, from the very first paragraph, which I'd like to read to you um, to get us rolling here. It is a, a very, in, in the history of business writing, this is a really remarkable way to start a book. We are all still in the earliest stages of learning how what we do for a living both threatens nature and fails to meet our deepest human needs. The impoverishment of our world and the devaluing of the priceless undermine our physical and economic well-being. Yet the depth and breadth of technological innovation of the past few decades shows that we have not lost our most useful gifts. Humans are ingenious, adaptive, and clever. We also have moral capacity compassion for life, and an appetite for justice. We now need to more fully engage these gifts to make economic life more socially just and environmentally responsible and less destructive to nature and the commons that sustain us. Pretty powerful opening words. So I'm gonna start with just a very basic question. What was your purpose in writing this book, and to whom did you most want to address it? Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah. Um, first of all, Robert, with your background in economics and religion, you should be working for the Vatican Bank and the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring that up with the Pope. <laughs> well, uh, I wrote a book uh, before called Let My People Go Surfing, and it was basically a book for my own employees to explain to them why we were doing what we were doing and why we were breaking the rules of business. And, and uh, so that, that was the real purpose of it. And it's become you know, much more widespread than I ever dreamed. It's in, was it 19 languages or something? I can't remember now. Um, it's been used uh, as in a lot of universities and schools. But I saw uh, a need for a how-to book because we had so many companies coming to us and, and saying, uh, first of all, coming to see if we're real or is this just green marketing. And they wanted to do a lot of the things that we're doing. And uh, I originally got the idea from an organization in Napa Valley called Napa Green, which is one of the most effective grassroots organizations I've ever heard of. It's a bunch of housewives that put together a Xerox three-page list of things that a vineyard can do to become more sustainable. And under energy, there's all these checklists of things they can do, underwater use. And, and so if, if a vineyard checks off a certain number of those, then they can be certified as a Napa green vineyard. And you know, there's no vineyard that can do even 50% of them probably. But it makes you aware of all the things that you're not doing. And this is all volunteer. This is a, has nothing to do with government. There's no money changing hands. And what they, and almost every vineyard is tr trying to uh, sign up. After they do the vineyards, then they want to do the restaurants and the businesses. After they do that, they want to do the houses. In other words, they're trying to green an entire ecosystem from the ground up, which is, you know, as you know, change doesn't come from the top, as we all know. It comes from the bottom, and it's the most effective organization I've seen, and we wanted to do the same thing uh, with a book. I thought about upgrading my Let My People Go Surfing book, but it's, 
because it's, I don't know, five or six years old or something, but um, Vincent had a better idea, which is to do a separate book. And I feel like the most important part of the book is the checklist in the back, which we have all the different things you can do to become a more, well, a more responsible company, because I hate that word, sustainable. <laughs> Vincent? Yeah, I think, I think I came at it from a little uh, different angle. I've been with the company from the start, but I'm vocationally a writer. And uh, I was seeing that I was kind of coming to the, toward the end of my time at Patagonia, and I thought, how do I kind of organize what I think about this place? And how do I, I, I also was very curious about how the culture could survive from a very small company, it was like 10, 15 employees and about 200,000 a year when I started, and now it's 2,000 employees and about 600 million. And I wanted to kind of figure out for myself what the company was about, and it, as a writer, the way you do that is to write it down. So, and, and I also wanted to leave something for uh, the people who work for me that could then be passed down as a kind of a supplement to let my people go surfing. So we got together, and I think that actually the combination of the trying to figure out what this company is about with the checklist is really strong, because the checklist m makes it much more concrete. It makes it, we were talking about this earlier, I don't know if you've read the, um, the profile of Obama on Vanity Fair, but there's a statement at some point saying that the, the controversy machine is a lot bigger than the reality machine. And I think it's very important for people doing this work to bring a sense of reality about what responsible practices are and what the danger to the environment is, what the danger is to, to our social systems are as well. And the checklist, I think, brings it home in a way that um, a memoir or a, an argument for what we're doing doesn't. When I was in uh, business school, uh, one of the things that surprised me, because I came there as a minister full of uh, ideas about justice and theories and so forth, was that um, business school students in general were extremely focused on practicality, on getting things done. Now, they didn't always think about the bigger picture, but present them with a specific problem, and they were astonishing in their creativity. And I do want to say that almost half of this book is made up of these very detailed checklists, um, which I think anyone interested in this should look at because lists have the ability to stimulate thinking. And um, you know, it would be interesting for, for the schools at Yale to look through this and say, well, some things may not apply, but other things might very much apply. So that's one of the things I wanted, and I should have mentioned at the beginning. Um, I want to ask now about sort of where we are in the United States. Um, I was just talking to my friend Steve Peterson, who's here on the Yale Divinity School uh, Advisory Board, and he commented that we seem to be in a period of tremendous ferment. On the one hand, there's a lot of discontent. There are people who are unhappy uh, with the inequality, with the environmental problems, limits um, that uh, we are bumping up against. Um, on the other hand, there seems to be some real learning going on and a lot of creativity. We see that in the New Economics Institute, and we see that in various regions, and we see that in books like this. Uh, so my question is kind of a big question, but you address it in several different places in this book, is how do you think our economy needs to change and businesses need to change to meet the needs for greater social justice, more meaningful work, and planetary survival? Well, I, I go back to that book, Small is Beautiful, which has a lot of truth in it. If you follow what nature has to tell us, nature loves diversity, it hates monoculture, it hates an accumulation of anything in one place. It's always trying to spread everything out. And if you look at what humans try to do, we try to collect everything together. We want to centralize everything. And yet, you look at the British Empire, you look at the Soviet Union, you look at Yugoslavia, you look at, you know, we tried to do nation states in Africa that makes no sense at all. 
In fact, I'd say the United States is far too big a country. It should be broken up. I mean, I personally don't want, you know, the senators from Alabama telling me what to do, and they don't want senators from California telling them what to do. We should, and the best we're accomplishing with government is cutting the baby in half. Mm -hmm. And compromise doesn't solve the problem, it just, you know, either there's a right way or a wrong way, and the middle ground is not, doesn't get us anywhere. And, you know, California is the ninth largest economy in the world. It should be its own country, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so I, I think, for me, a lot of the problems in society are not going to be solved with more technology. Technology just destroys jobs. It's, uh, it's going to be solved, I think, by going back to some of the lessons we learned a long time ago, which... You know, if you want to employ people, the only way I can think of is go back to labor-intensive agriculture. I mean, personally, if, if I was looking for a job, hell on earth would be staring at a computer all day long. I'd much rather be picking fruit or picking grapes in Provence. That'd be even better. <laughs> <laughs> but... I think we have, we have to get away from this gigantism. We have to get away from endless growth. You know, it's, it's corporations, public corporations that are fueling this endless growth. They have to grow 15% every year, otherwise, you know, the stock price goes down and then the, the CEO and the upper management can't retire to their golf courses. And it's absolutely wrong. And uh, so anyway, that's, that's my own take on it. I think the, we have to decouple the idea of economic growth from prosperity in some way, and certainly from material use. I think one of the things, the, when you talk about the, contra again, sort of the controversy machine getting larger than, than, than what we perceive reality to be, um, nobody really understands here uh, we don't have much manufacturing in this com country anymore, and, and nobody really understands the complexity of the supply chain and the immensity of it behind everything that's made. One of the things we've started to do is to try to talk about that in our own clothing, about how much, in a single polo shirt, how much water is used to grow the cotton, how much uh, it, it, a single polo shirt will generate several times its own weight in waste, several times its own weight in carbon emissions. Um, a wedding ring generates uh, 20 tons of mine waste. So that everything that's made has an economic cost and often a social cost. And I think until we start to understand that and, and decouple the idea of economic health, prosperity, from uh, increased use of material goods, we're going to continue to be in the kind of trouble we are now, and it will accelerate. There's a great Ernest Hemingway line about, uh, in Sun Also Rises, how, do, uh, how did you go bankrupt? One character asks another and says, in two ways, uh, gradually, then all of a sudden. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that that's the kind of bankruptcy that our, that our system faces. I'd like to continue on that a little bit. First of all, uh, uh, Yvonne, I did meet before, and, and Vincent and I, um, I did not ask him to mention E.F. Schumacher, but E.F. Schumacher and Small is Beautiful is the prior organization for the New Economics Institute that grew and renamed itself. So we actually are the custodians of the uh, E.F. Schumacher books and mm -hmm. materials out in our library in Great Barrington. Mm -hmm. Um, and we puzzle over this and feel that, and I want to invite everyone in the audience to start thinking about this, because um, this question of how we're going to continue to provide prosperity and well-being for billions of people on the planet without hitting at either high speed or low speed the limits, uh, the planetary limits that have been set for us. In fact, the many limits that we're already exceeding. So if I could... Um, just come back to that and go a little bit more deeply. You talk about meaningful work at a living wage and prosperity in communities. Um, 
this is a, a central question, especially in the developing world where there's not enough work and there's not enough prosperity. How can we make progress in this area when we're simultaneously being confronted with the absolutely rock hard planetary limits that we're going to hit, whether it's sooner, whether it's a little later, but that uh, uh, scientifically we know are certain. Well, I think there's, there's another old, old quote that uh, I think it's from Jefferson, that genius is the capacity to hold two equal and opposite ideas in the head at the same time. And, <laughs> and I think pretty shortly we're all gonna be geniuses. Uh, because we're going to have to, I mean, even if, if we, if Evo and I make arguments against, uh, for decoupling growth from, from, from the idea of prosperity, even in, the fact is in the short run, run it's horribly, uh, uh, it's, it's horrible for the number of people who are underemployed right now um, and who will continue to be uh, without some kind of growth to the economy. So I, I think we're gonna have to take a long-term and a short-term view. We're also gonna have to take a kind of first world and a developing world points of view into account. And I think when you're talking about the economy, there is the issue of, of doing more things on a small scale and doing them better, like organic farming, which is much healthier for the planet and possibly not for people, but it tastes better um, uh, than industrial farming. But there's also the question of, of industrial scale and changing some of those processes. So in the book I talk about, or we, we both talk about the, the work we've done with the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, which is to join together with uh, a, a large consortium of other companies who are responsible, the, the, we're up, almost up to about 70 members. Who are, uh, the goal is to get people who are responsible for about half of the apparel and footwear made in the world establish standards for uh, different kinds of standards for social uh, justice, uh, economic, uh, or, and environmental improvements. And what that would do is to change the way those things are made. And when you change industrial processes on a huge scale, you can make huge improvements. So even though we might make the argument that in the long run, small is beautiful, you also need to work on the very dirty practices of the brown economy right now and to change them and to get groups of people together to change them. You know, I, whenever, whenever I'm confronted with a business problem, the answer is always increase the quality, always. Hmm. Whether, I mean, I don't care what the problem is. And I think the answer to this is more labor intensive work whether it's organic farming. I mean, John Jevons at the Ecology Action Center in, in uh, California has proven that you can get more vegetables per acre with labor-intensive bioagriculture than you can with this so-called green revolution, which is the green revolution has produced a lot of food in a short period of time but at the expense of destroying millions and millions of acres of topsoil. And, and that employs people in meaningful work. And uh, I, I always, you know, I've heard it said that man is the only animal that doesn't learn from nature, from history. We don't learn from history. We keep repeating the same problems. But there are some lessons in the past that are really uh, important, and I've seen it over and over again in my 73 years that um, by simplifying your life, looking for simple solutions rather than complex solutions to problems, has proven to work really well. In fact, uh, <laughs> give you an example, I, I'm a fly fisherman, I do a lot of it, lately I've been fishing with a, with a pole and no reel with a 20-foot line tied on the end. I've been fishing in a style that goes back to the 15th century, all the way back to the first book ever written about fishing by Dame Juliana Bernas. And 
Um, I go out with some of the best fly fishermen in the world. At the end of the day, they'll catch six or eight fish. I'll catch 50. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I mean, I could go on about this for a long time. But, <laughs> but more and more, I realize that the answer to a lot of the world's problems is, is simplicity and quality. Go ahead. The thing I would add is uh, uh, Bill McKibben talked in one of his books about uh, the higher yields of organic farming. But he also talked, he said that what it took was a lot more knowledge yeah. uh, of the land. You really have to walk your fields. You really have to know what you're doing. And I think that that's going to be critical for all, for all businesses for the next 10 or 15 years because everything is going to change so much and so often that everybody, in order to uh, have a, a, a company that thrives and to employ other people is going to know an awful lot more about their business than they do now. The same thing applies to conventional businesses as to farming. The, the, the industrial farming is dumb, it's large scale, it's unsustainable, and it takes more intelligence to do it on a smaller scale. But when you, when you know your land, then you can also adapt to to new threats and to new conditions or to new opportunities a lot better than you can if you're entirely dependent on very uh, simple, dumb, big systems. So I'd like to ask you a question that we talked about briefly and you said people often beat around the bush and you encouraged me not to, so I'm going to ask this. Um, uh, you operate in a very complex environment. You have to meet the expectations from customers, suppliers, competitors, communities, government regulators, and all different kinds of people all expecting you and asking you to do things. Now, some people have pointed out that because your company is privately held, you are able to do things that avoid the quarterly pressures of financial uh, disclosure and uh, uh, financial performance, and that allows you a flexibility and the ability to make longer-term decisions. On the other hand, there's a well-established literature that says to be a publicly traded company allows for a kind of accountability for management that sometimes doesn't exist when you are a privately held company. So my question is, how would you say your governance structure over the years, over 40 years, has affected uh, Patagonia's decisions, its mission, and its strategy? And are you in some way recommending that we should have more privately held companies in order to grant them the freedom from uh, the pressures that, uh, that publicly held companies sometimes face? Just a, quick, just a quick statement. There are so many more privately held companies than public. Publicly held companies are large, but there are only 4,000 of them in the United States, down from 7,000 uh, a few years ago. So uh, it, uh, it, it's a... It's a very, uh, I'll just let you. Could, could I also in yeah. interject? Some, you told me something uh, just before that I didn't know, and maybe it has bearing on this, which is that you're also a B corporation. Right. And uh, perhaps you'd like to explain what a B corporation is and how that fits with uh, the, the question of being privately held. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, a few years ago when. Uh, when, uh, anyway, uh, the descendant of Henry Ford was running Ford Motor Company. Bill Ford? Bill Ford. Yeah. And he was being touted as an environmentalist. And environmentalists were asking, well, why, why do you make SUVs? You know, they're gas guzzlers. They roll over every chance they get. Um, <laughs> and he said, well, we'll stop making them when their customer tells us to. You know, thinking that he's, you know, really responsive to his customers and everything. But, his, but it was Henry Ford that said, the customer didn't want me to make an automobile. They wanted me to make a faster horse. <laughs> and if you wait for the customer that tells you what to do, you're too late. So 
I actually have you know, way more power as owner of Patagonia than a CEO of a large public company who his hands are tied by the stockholders. Uh, you know, if, if they give $100 to Planned Parenthood, they're going to have all these people you know, banging their tennis shoes at the stockholder meeting and complaining. And you know, I can basically do what I want. So it's given us, you know, when we switched over from industrially grown cotton to organically grown, that decision to do that as a public company would have been unconscionable because nobody else was doing it. A few companies had tried it and they'd stopped because it was unsuccessful. There was no organic cotton in the country. Um, and it was a big risk. We were risking 25% of our sales on an unproven thing. And I just said, I'm giving the company 18 months to do it. And if we don't do it, we're never going to make another piece of cotton again. It's I appropriate it. to mention in the, with a divinity school hosting that we had to pray for rain in the San Joaquin <laughs> Valley. <laughs> make sure that uh, our cotton contracts came through. Well, you know, we can take the risk that a public company can't. And uh, I, you know, I, I, well, first of all, you know, how many people really knew what was going on in Enron? publicly traded company. You have no idea. When you're buying stock in some of these corporations, you have no idea what's going on there. And you get, you know, the, the big financial uh, reporting. Is, I mean, you get two sets of books. You get, uh, they show a profit every quarter. As a business, you cannot show a profit every quarter. I don't care who you are. It's, I mean, it's just, but that's what happens. The other question, so, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, I'm down on public corporations and down on the stock market. I have nothing to do with it. I have no stocks. My retirement fund is tied up in uh, second growth forests in the Pacific Northwest. So no matter what the stock market does, my trees grow 10% a year. <laughs> I think one of the, <laughs> the, the, the problem of, 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 a, of accounting, financial accounting is the sole legal measurement of corporate success is kind of paralleled with using GDP as the sole measure of economic success for a country. It doesn't really reveal the total health of the company. It just reveals how the, you know, kind of what the artfulness of the accountants uh, and, and, and some indications of the basic health, of the, of, the, of the financial health, but not the social health or the environmental health of the company. Uh, I'd like to come back to that question in a little bit after we open it up. I'm going to ask one more question, and so please be prepared with your own questions. And if you, in fact, even like to start lining up now at either one of these microphones, that would be great. Uh, one of the things that, uh, and this uh, reminds me from the um, uh, I found the story about cotton really quite remarkable. And then you say uh, under the chapter, what we do for a living, you talk about that there were a handful of moments that stunned us into consciousness. Um, I'd be really interested, and I think the audience would be interested in hearing more well, about that. Well, I, th I think I have, a, I have a story about our, our Boston store. We opened a store in Boston. It was an old building, and we retrofitted it fixed it up, and opened it in the springtime, brought in a lot of uh, sportswear because it was all it was in the spring. And within three days, our employees were complaining about getting headaches. So we closed the store, brought in an environmental engineer, and he said, oh, he says, you're poisoning your employees. <laughs> OK. He says, yeah, the problem is you got the ventilation system is recycling the same air, not bringing any outside air, and it's, it's faulty. So most companies would have just said, fix the ventilation system. I don't want to hear about the poisoning. But I wanted to hear about the poisoning. It turned out that it was formaldehyde poisoning, which is put on all 
cotton clothing that is sanfurized, shrink resistant, wrinkle resistant. It's a resin put on. And it, just in the last few months, the EPA has acknowledged that it is very, very toxic. It's still being used, and it's, and it's in fact, hair salons use it to straighten hair. They put it right on your head. And uh, I said, man, we, I had no idea this was happening, and how do we get rid of formaldehyde? And I had no idea, because all we did was call a fabric supplier, and he'd come by with books on fabrics and say, oh yeah, I like this shirting, you know, give me 10,000 yards of this, and we had no idea how cloth is finished. We had no idea which fibers are more toxic, whether should we be making clothing out of polyester, which is made from petroleum, or should we be making it out of 100% pure cotton, but industrially grown? We had no idea. So that's that was the aha moment that we started questioning what we were doing, because we were doing business just like everybody else. And once you start asking those questions, then you're, for us, we're committed to doing something about it. Once we find out that we're using toxic dyes, then we stop using toxic dyes. and, and uh, and so it goes all the way down through the supply chain now that, you know, like Vincent said, we calculate how much water we use in a t-shirt. Well, it's not just water. Water isn't just water. It makes a big difference whether the water comes from the sky and rain, whether it comes from a gigantic dam that's been put in that's destroyed a lot of people's lives and, and uh, very damaging, or is it uh, depleting an, aqu uh, an aquifer that uses, that's millions of years old, the fossil water that's not being replenished? So now, you know, we're faced with, okay, where are we going to grow our cotton? Because we want to grow it when we want to buy cotton from areas where it rains. And, but then that's, that adds more problems because there's more bugs in a wet, humid climate. And I mean, living and examining life and business is a pain in the ass. <laughs> that's a quote. But that's what we have to do. <laughs> <laughs> OK, please. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Smith. I'm a joint degree student with the School of Management and the School of Forestry here. And I wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned narrowness of using GDP as an economic uh, measure of success uh, and financial accounting for companies. Uh, so what are some alternative Excuse measures? Me. We're having yes? a little trouble hearing you. So maybe you want to. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, there's a sort of strange echo. So if you want to. Uh, I can try and speak up. Is that better? Uh, a bit better. But just OK. Go ahead. I'll try and speak slowly. Thank you. OK. Uh, what are some alternative indicators of success that Patagonia has, is using in, inside the organization? How did you come up with those, and how are they integrated into the company? Ooh, I have a hard time hearing that. Um, it's whether we have any in, internal indicators other than financial of the health of the company. And we, oh, you know, if you ask me what our profits were last year or what they're going to be this year, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I own this business to basically put into action what all the smart people are saying we have to do to save this planet. So there's a lot of, you know, convening going on, talking about all our problems, but there's nobody out there actually doing it. And that's why we exist, is to, is to actually find out where we're doing something wrong and then fix it, and then prove to the rest of the world that it's good business. So bottom, bottom line, <laughs> that's my bottom line. <laughs> just, just, uh, just, um, I think that we, we don't have any indicators that are, that are unique to us, but it's very, imp we're doing work now with, um, with other organizations with the sustainable 
Apparel Coalition that I mentioned. And they're coming up with the indicators that all of the, our companies can use and use deeply within our accounting system. So when designers are making choices about fabric, they'll have that at their fingertips. What is it a, you know, is it a 49? Uh, rating or is it a 64? What, what, what goes on with this particular textile? So for, for, and for accounting practices to mean anything, they have to be c comparable among companies. So I think the kind of work that Bob has done in the past and is going on in several other areas will, uh, will generate uh, something that we might use eventually, but there's nothing we're coming up with individually. If I could just step out of the moderator role for a second and answer a little bit uh, from what I know. Um, so one of the challenges that led to the creation of the Global Reporting Initiative, which is an international uh, standard, was this confusion about how to measure different kinds of, and forgive me, um, sustainability performance. And people had lots of different ideas, but there was no general acceptance. So one thing, now the GRI as it's known is less commonly used in the United States, but it's used by about 3,000 global companies uh, uh, around the world. And uh, the other thing that I really want to flag for you, it's the thing that I've been talking up uh, around, we spoke about it at lunch, is that um, there is a movement right now uh, taking place among some of the very biggest uh, standard setting bodies in the world, accounting for, called the uh, integrated, International Integrated Reporting Council. Now, that sounds boring, but it's really not. It was pulled together by the Prince of Wales, and it brought together the International Accounting Standards Board, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, the, all of the big four accounting firms, and they are rethinking the very definition of business. I'll just give you two sentences about that. Instead of just thinking of it as taking financial capital in turning it around and then having financial results. They are thinking of redefining the value creation process as drawing multiple forms of capital in, natural, social, human, uh, intellectual, and so forth, turning it around in a unique business model, and then having multiple outcomes, financial, social, human, intellectual, capital. Now that is about to appear in an exposure draft or a, a framework which, believe me, the more of you that could read it and comment on it, because the United States is largely silent on this, and yet it could redefine what accounting and measurement is for firms. There's been some discussion of this for countries, but countries are place-based, firms are not. And looking at how this would work for firms, so it's the, it, the, the website is theiirc.org and very important, interesting work. Um, different companies make different uses, and I'm not surprised to hear that Patagonia is still looking, but uh, there is some hopeful progress being made. Thank you. Uh, maybe we should take one social media question? Yes, I have a question from Helena Torreson, who's watching from Norway. How can Patagonia instill the value Wait. of dematerialization into their I can't customers? Quite hear you. I'm sorry? You can't hear me? Okay. Uh, well, I can sort of hear you. OK, I'll talk louder. This is from Helena Torreson, who's watching from Norway. How can Patagonia instill the value of dematerialization into their customers while still selling their product and growing as a company? OK, did you hear that question? Um, you know, during this, this last recession, we've never had such growth. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I love recessions. We've always thrived in a recession. In a recession, people become very conservative. They don't buy fashion because that they'll have to throw that piece away in a short period of time. And they'll buy products that last a long time. They'll buy multifunctional products. In other words, they become very conservative consumers. And that's the kind of goods that we make. And uh, so we thrive in a recession. When the economy is great, everybody gets silly again and they start you know, buying things that they want but don't need. And uh, we, we have loyal customers. We grow what we call natural growth. When the customer tells us that they just got a catalog 
and they ordered 10 things and they got six, it tells us that we're not making enough. In other words, we don't prime the pump by advertising in all of these fashion magazines and stuff like that. Our, our advertising budget is less than half of 1% of sales. So we let the customer tell us how big we should be and how much we should make. And with this new millennium generation, those are our customers. Uh, this is the only hopeful note that I've found going around speaking in universities and stuff, is that this generation knows what the problems are and they want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, my generation saw inconvenient truth. My friends who consider themselves environmentalists, and I say, well, what'd you think of that? Oh, God, that was heavy, uh, blah, blah, blah. Well, did you change your light bulbs? Uh, no. <laughs> We're not going to do anything about global warming. We're already way too late. The only hope is with the younger generation. And that's one reason why my business is doing so well, is they believe in what we're doing. I mean, green business is good business. Do you have anything? Um, yeah. I'm not sure if the, if the uh, person from Norway is, I'm not sure quite what the question is, but I know we're asked a lot. We took out an ad in the New York Times on uh, Black Friday last year saying, don't buy this jacket, and then put it on our website on Cyber Monday. And we got a lot of, um, we got a lot of response, mostly, mostly positive. The, the, the headline was an attention getter, and what the copy did was to talk about what the environmental impact of that particular jacket was and that you should be conscious and careful when you're buying things. People accused us of hypocrisy because we are a, a company and we do have a marketing department, we have a sales department. But I think if companies don't raise this kind of question, who is? Um, and I, I think it's a legitimate question for us to raise. We're, we're, it's also part of an effort we began about five years ago. We take back for recycling any product at the end of its life. And we determined about halfway through this campaign that we're, we were doing it backwards. That really, if you want to address the, the mantra of the four R's of uh, reduce, repair, reuse, recycle, you have to start with reduce and end up with recycle. It's the least important thing you can do. And so if we don't talk about the necessity to reduce uh, uh, material consumption, we're really not much in line with our values. So we have to do it, and we have to take it on the chops if we're accused of hypocrisy. You've been very patient. Thank you. <laughs> um, my name's Kate. I'm at the forestry school. And my question is, um, with a lot of the responsibility movement within corporations, we hear about the triple bottom line, how Walmart will um, reduce their impact on the environment by installing a greener fleet of trucks and then save X million dollars, and it's a win across the board. But um, as far as I know, Walmart just takes those savings and then builds another Walmart or you know, continues to expand. So how do you make sure that the initiatives that you take are actually making um, an absolute improvement towards the goal of reducing the environmental impact and not just doing things less bad or, or reinvesting that money in something that's causing another impact um, in a different way? I, I think you can't. I think you have to have a high tolerance for ambiguity. So what Walmart is doing with its trucks is a good thing, and what Walmart has done in the dairy industry to reduce uh, methane from cows and, and, the, and practices is a good thing. But there is still the question of the absolute scale of a Walmart. There's still a question about his labor practices. So, you know, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a final answer to that. I, th I think you have to kind of respect what they do on one end and discourage them from, from the other or uh, make your choice about where you're going to shop. Yeah. yeah. I, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think, I think we ought to ditch the mics. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to low technology because it's really hard to understand the questions up here. Yeah, actually, just yell it out. Is, I don't know <laughs> what this would do for the taping of this. Oh yeah, but maybe if right? you step back a little bit, maybe we can hear you better than them. Yeah, 
Okay, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, great. My name is Justin Linden Mayer. I'm a, another joint degree at the School of Management and School of Forestry. And um, I found your comments about um, size and the danger of um, being too big um, as you know, a, a real, um, as something to, to really take seriously. And so my question is, at what point does Patagonia become too mm -hmm. big in terms of yeah. the potential to really um, adversely impact the environment? And sort of looking at it from the opposite perspective, um, one could probably make an argument that some of you know, the massive multinationals, because of their size, have the ability to have a really dramatic positive impact by just tweaking you know, a small part of their operations. So if you could just comment on using one's size to its advantage. Well, I, I wrestle with this question all the time. Uh, you know, as, as a climber or serious whitewater kayaker and, you know, doing risk-type sports all my life, you never want to exceed your resources. If you're a 5'10 climber, you don't solo 5'11 because then you're dead. And I think uh, society is always pushing you to exceed your resources. And we constantly question ourselves, are we the size that we should be. And um, we try to live within that. And you know, when you, when you learn to ski, your growth curve is not like this. That's, that's the curve of a public corporation. They have to grow 15% a year. They grow like this. When you learn to ski, you go like this, and then you're getting nowhere for a while. You take a lesson, you go up a little bit, so it goes in steps. And so, you know, we grew 30% last year. This year, we decided that's too much. We're going to go to 15%. Maybe next year, we're only going to grow 3%. So we don't have to follow the dictates of the stock market. And, um, but I think we're at a point where we're making as much clothes as I want to make. <laughs> and I'm very pessimistic about the future, so we're diversifying into food. I think, uh, you know, if there is a crash for one reason or another, if, you know, our power grid goes out in America because some tree fell on a on a power line somewhere. I mean, you know, it's we're so at risk in this society that any little thing that happens around the world, the stock market crashes and so but we're gonna have to eat. We're not gonna need, you know, expensive clothes, but we're gonna have to eat. So I'm very interested in in taking a leadership position and figuring out a better way of feeding ourselves. Let's put it that way. And uh, so we're diversifying. You know, 3M Corporation is a huge corporation, but it's made up of, I don't know, three or 400 different companies instead of one. Like I was saying about the United States being too big to govern. It is too big to govern. And in fact, uh, we have a flawed constitution. Uh, there isn't an emerging country in the world that wants to copy our constitution <laughs> or go through our electoral process. Oh my God. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I think about this all the time. Yes. Oh, okay, I'll right. go next. Okay. This is a question from Grace Davis, who's watching from Santa Cruz, California. What is Patagonia doing to bring all clothing manufacturing back to the US or closer to the point of sale? I couldn't quite hear it. Um, there's, 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 we're not bringing back manufacturing to the United States. Um, 
it may be that manufacturing eventually comes back to the United States, but we're still dependent on the complex chain of textiles and, 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 uh, and sewing assembly. When we started business, we did about half of our uh, uh, sewing in the United States because half of the fabrics were here and about half overseas because that's where the sportswear was made. And over the years, uh, that infrastructure dried up. But it's also moved around the world. Um, it moved from Hong Kong to China to, uh, we now make our most complex garments in, in Vietnam. And um, it's moving, I think it's probably got another 10 or 15 years. We do not chase labor ourselves, but we're part of an industry that chases labor. And until that comes to an end, I think we probably won't have uh, manufacturing in the States. And if we do, it will be because we've made some kind of innovation in, in clothing manufacturing. The apparel is one of the oldest technologies that dates back to the Industrial Revolution and it hasn't radically changed, both textile and sewing. So, and then the other thing is there's assumption in the United States that we're bringing things closer to the customer. But in fact, we're, uh, some of our sales are in the United States, but we sell quite a bit in Japan and Europe and other markets. And the way the, uh, in some of our, in Vietnam and in China, there is a lot of clustering of the textile mills around the manufacturing that's actually very efficient. It just doesn't happen in the States. So. I, I think uh, if we brought our manufacturing back to the States, we'd become martyrs. We'd go out of business. I mean, look at American Apparel, which is one of the few companies still making everything in, in LA, and they're on the verge of bankruptcy. They, I mean, I don't want to go for martyrdom. I don't make a very good martyr. And uh, it, it's, I, I'd say really good sewing takes an incredible amount of skill. It takes people who devote their whole life in sewing. And our most technical products are all done in Asia by excellent workers in factories that you can eat uh, off the floor. It's, uh, we could never do that in this country again. We have problems with the, uh, the factories that we use in Vietnam, China, and Mexico have daycare. Uh, some factories uh, give uh, house loans to people who want to buy houses. Um, and the conditions actually for the factories that we have left in the United States, we do use a number of people who make t-shirts we really have to monitor those conditions more closely than we do with our Asian factories because the conditions are worse, the pay is worse, and the benefits are less. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name's Marvin, and I'm with the School of Management. I'm just wondering, as an accomplished mountaineer and a surfer and a fisherman, um, some lessons that you've learned that you've brought to business leadership. I think you kind of touched on it a little bit in your answer to one of the previous questions. But I was wondering if there are any things from kind of your life as a mountaineer and stuff that you brought into business. I didn't hear that at all. Whether you, lessons from your, your life as a mountaineer affect uh, the way you do business? Well, I've been a student of Zen philosophy most of my life. And I've learned a lot uh, about you know, climbing and not focusing on the end goal, but focusing on the process. The reason I don't care to hear about whether we're, what our profit is gonna be this year, all I care about is that if the process is going well, we're gonna be profitable. And that's a big lesson I learned in, in climbing. And also I, I learned, uh, that what is sometimes seemingly a risk is not a risk. Like for instance, I can tell you a little story. I, 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 I used to do a lot of kayaking, a lot of whitewater kayaking, and, and I learned the hard way. There were no kayaking schools. My first trip uh, with the, my dirtbag buddies, I, my first river was a class three, my second, the next day was a class four, 
The next day was a class five, and I ended up a two-week trip with 15 stitches in my face. <laughs> but I had to learn on my own. But the day I really learned to kayak was the day I ran a little local river in Jackson Hole that's a class four in high water, and I ran it in high water, and I ran it without a paddle. I just got a wild hair. I had learned to do a roll with the hand, my hands. So I did this thing without a paddle, which seems really stupid. But what it did is it taught me that I had to turn the boat by putting it on its edge and carving. Instead of just doing a sweep stroke at the last second and avoiding a rock, I had to look way ahead. When I went over a drop, I had to make sure I didn't end up like this. And I had to anticipate it and go forward. Anyway, I learned to kayak that day. And I did a perfect run of, this is a, a river that falls 100 feet a mile, and, and it's, there's no eddies, and it's just a big flush. I did a perfect run. I went down like a fish. Well, what seemed to be a high-risk thing actually was the best thing I've ever done, because then I went on to do first descents all over the world and all over South America and New Guinea and river, dangerous rivers, and I've never hurt myself. So by taking a small risk, you avoid the big risk. And that's what I think doing these kind of sports has taught me. And it's the same thing in business. We take these risks that a public corporation would say, man, that's big, out there. We're not out there at all. It's, it's the fun part of business is, is breaking the rules and making them work. I'm wondering if you'd like to tell us at this point, uh, and we'll of course keep going with the questions, but um, about the responsible company uh, project that you are pulling together and getting ready to launch. Yeah, we, um, people who are familiar with our catalog know that we run an environmental campaign for about a year and a half to two years at a, at a time. And uh, our, our last campaign has been called Our Common Waters and is focused on, on uh, uh, freshwater uh, scarcity and uh, pollution and the dangers to it. Our next uh, campaign, which will start in fall 13, will talk about, will be called The Responsible Economy, and we'll talk about some of the questions we raised here about how you can have uh, prosperity decoupled from uh, ongoing increases in material use. And it's, I think it's very much in the air. I've been around, I've been in, back east for a couple of weeks talking to different colleges. I think it, it's, a, it's a topic that everybody wants to address but hasn't been addressed uh, publicly. I think people are ready to talk about it and uh, we'll be the first uh, company to do so. And this is, I think, one of the things that would look like a big risk for, for a public company but will look like a small risk for us. When did you say it would start? Fall, fall 2013. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name's Aaron. I'm another joint degree student at the School of Forestry and the School of Management. And at the management school, we talk a lot about corporate culture and how that attracts talent, it just furthers workplace productivity, and any number of, the, of other intangibles. In your first book, you talk a lot about the working environment at Patagonia. So I was wondering if you could comment on how workplace culture can help further your environmental goals? Well, uh, certainly it comes from the top. I mean, you know, my wife and I are both committed uh, pessimists. <laughs> <laughs> We're doom bats. <laughs> we believe that there's no difference between a pessimist that says, oh, it's all over, don't bother doing anything. And an optimist that says, oh, everything's going to be fine, don't bother doing anything. I'm a pessimist that wants to sleep at night, so I, I want to be, feel like I'm part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And uh, uh, <laughs> I forgot what the... The culture, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, corporate culture, the most important person in a company is the gatekeeper. 
you can change your company by who you hire overnight, let me tell you. And we've made some bad hires because of that. Uh, you know, like I said, we give money to Planned Parenthood, and I've had people in the company say, you know, I'm really opposed to this. And I tell them, you know, you shouldn't be working for a company where you believe they're doing the wrong thing. That's <laughs> just the way it is. You should go work for a company that, you know, believes in the values that you do. And so we're very careful in who we hire. For every job opening we have at Patagonia, we have an average of 900 applications. We just hired a corporate attorney from Levi's who is leaving a very high level, high paying position to come work for us because she wants to do more than be a corporate attorney. Um, and it's, it's self-replicating. If, if you have all your employees feeling like they're working for more than just a, a paycheck and they're actually part of the solution to the world's problems, you don't get anybody that cheats at work. You don't get anybody that takes advantage of, of uh, our work policy. Like, you know, we have this policy of let my people go surfing, which means I don't care when you work, where you work, as long as the job gets done. That's all I care about. I've only had one instance where I feel like anybody took advantage of that. And my wife was at the hairdresser, and here one of the guys was having his getting a $40 haircut in the middle of the day. <laughs> That's the only time they've ever taken advantage of that policy. But it, it, it's, uh, you know, it starts with not having special parking places for management. When I go into our cafeteria, I pay just like everybody else. I don't get a free lunch. And uh, so that sends a message to the whole company, this is the way it should be. We are entering the last uh, 15 minutes or so, and I'm going to keep going. I want to make a couple of um, uh, quick announcements about opportunities that I hope you will consider, because there are so many things. We've all have said that we sense this. Um, and I'm sorry if this sounds a little bit like an advertisement, but it's also an opportunity. Uh, last year, there was a student-led conference at Harvard University um, on the new economy. And uh, we supported that with a relatively small grant of $5,000 and some advice about who you might want to, that they might want to invite and so forth. We just have received another uh, much larger grant for almost $200,000 to support eight more student-led conferences on the new economy. And we are going to be announcing that and hiring a conference coordinator. But if this is a topic that really interests you, uh, given all of the wonderful interconnections that already exist at Yale, we would love to entertain an application uh, from whatever assortment of student groups that might want to do this. Our ultimate goal in, is to hold 100 student conferences uh, in 2013-2014 in order to help stimulate this discussion and a real rethinking by faculty, by alumni, by administrators, and of course by students themselves, both undergraduates and graduates. So that's uh, something. The other thing that I want to mention to you, which uh, how many of you heard Bill McKibben when he came uh, relatively recently? Okay, so you know Bill is getting uh, geared up for a major debate about fossil fuel uh, after the election. And he believes that the time has come to, uh, for institutions to start shedding their fossil fuel stock. I asked him what he thought the connection was between the new economy and the fossil fuel campaign, and he said in a very pithy way, as he does, he said, the new economy will flourish when we get the old fossil fuel economy's dead weight off our backs. And so there is a connection between the frustrations and difficulties that we've experienced in fossil fuel, uh, which is a very complex topic and the opportunities that exist in the new economy. So I want to make you aware that these are just at the time of very rapid change. We're lucky to have the kind of leaders um, uh, that um, we're hearing today, but there's so much more going on, and you can play a key role in that. Now I'm going to come back. I think it is your turn. 
And uh, as I say, we have about 15 more minutes. Uh, thank you all for being here today. I know New Haven's not quite as nice as Ventura, so thank you for being here. But um, I, my name's Heather West. I'm a, another joint degree with the School of Management and the School of Forestry. Um, and I actually wanted to build off of Aaron's questions. I feel like we've talked a lot about um, inter internal culture and thinking about, you know, what are the, the operations within your company and within the greater network of folks looking at cotton, looking at water use. But I know that um, Patagonia has taken a stand on a number of very outward advocacy facing issues with damnation coming out um, in a couple months, I think. And I, I was just kind of wondering what your, your thoughts are on private companies taking a more advocacy role in environmental issues, but issues that face the country at large. Is there a line? Who should be, you know, where, where is that line? Do you think it is? Um, I, can, I can tell you a little story. I, I hope I understood your question. I, I think I'm losing my hearing or something, but. It, there's, a, there's an echo for those of us sitting yeah. up here. I, uh, I gave a talk at a so-called sustainable fisheries conference in Vancouver a couple years ago. And I talked about what we're doing with our supply chain, where we're asking questions and finding out what we're doing, and then doing something about the bad things that we're doing. And, I, and I, then I challenged all these fish distributors and fishermen in this room. I said, you don't know where your fish comes from. I said, I know a lot about salmon, because I'm a fisherman. And I happen to know that if you catch a sockeye salmon at the mouth of the Columbia, it could be one of 10 that makes it all the way to Idaho to Redfish Lake to spawn. And now there's only nine. If you're catching uh, pink salmon, you're also having an incidental catch of chum salmon, which is an endangered species. And you have to dump them overboard, dead. And if you're catching a coho salmon, it could come from a river that has a pulp mill and it's full of dioxins, and it's, you shouldn't really be selling that, feeding that to people. Well, that went over like a big thud. <laughs> and so I walked away from that. And then I said, look, you need to know because your customer is going to demand it. When they go into a restaurant, a lot of restaurants are telling you the name of the farmer who grew the chicken or grew the lettuce. Or the name of the chicken. In the name of the chicken. In Portland, they have the name of the chicken. Yeah. <laughs> so I, went, I, went, I walked away from that conference thinking, oh, that was a waste of time. They're not going to change their practices and stuff. So then we, I said, look, I said to myself, well, you know, the only way to, to lead is by example. So we started our own salmon processing plant 80 miles from the ocean on the banks of the Skeena River in British Columbia, and we employ the local natives to fish in the old way with fish wheels and fish nets and uh, fish traps and, and beach stains. They catch the fish alive. They release the steelhead and the coho, which are unintended catch. They keep only the sockeye or the pink, whichever one we're looking for. They kill them and bleed them right away, which means a bled salmon will keep in your refrigerator for 20-something days as opposed to six or eight days with one that's not bled. And of course, none of them are bled when they catch them in the ocean because they just dump them in a hole. Anyway, it, so the reason we're doing this thing is to prove to the fishing industry this is the way it should be done. And this is the way it used to be done sustainably. The Indians along these rivers knew exactly how many salmon to take. And uh, when you catch them, and then it became illegal to catch them in those old ways because the white men wanted to catch them out in the ocean with their diesel powered boats. So like I said, the only way to lead is, is by example. And that's one of the things I want to do with this food business is, uh, is create change by doing it ourselves. You know, you know, when we talk about these students getting together and trying to figure out the next economy, the government's not going to figure it out. 
And in fact, it's up to us. I mean, we're, we're citizens, but we're also, according to the government, we're the consumers. That's what the government labels us. We're not citizens anymore, we're consumers. And that, you look under the word consumer in Webster's, it's one who uses up, who destroys. That's who we are. Stock market goes up and down according to how confident we are. And, but, if you look at any newspaper on a daily basis, you'll see that all the gains made in society are made by citizen activists. Civil democracy is the strongest force in society and we have to regain that. And we can do it, you know, not by giving up being consumers, but by being better consumers. Educating ourselves as to what we're buying and, and using that force to change society. And I think all of us want to do the right thing. It's just that we're not, we, we need to educate ourselves as to what we're doing. Most of the damage caused to the planet is done unintentionally. There's unintended consequences of everything that we do. And we have to anticipate that. We have to get back to the, uh, well, anyway, I got on a soapbox there. <laughs> um, we, um, this is, event was organized uh, largely by the Divinity School. We have the Dean of the Divinity School, the Yale Divinity School Advisory Board, many members. Uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about that very much. I'm wondering whether you have some particular observations or advice for what a uh, significant community like Yale Divinity School could be doing to play its part in this uh, conversation. Well, I just read your article on growth. I thought that was fantastic. And you, you challenged the school to, uh, all religions have to consider what we are doing to the planet. Right, right now, you know, it's doomsday. We have the growth of doomsday religions all over the world, and there's people giving up living on this planet and living for the next life, you know, living for those 72 virgins that are waiting for us. And um, this is it. This is the planet that we have. We're not going to colonize Mars, and uh, we better take care of it. And I think there's quite a few religions that are, and religious leaders that are understanding that. But quite a few that are not still. I think there's also, I, I, from what I've, I'm not religious, so, but what I've, what little I've seen is that I think religion is still concentrated on uh, private life and on kind of Sunday morning, um, on the opportunity to step out of daily life and reflect on it. When in fact, what we really need to do is go back to this question of of being citizens, what are we as moral beings? That has to be at the heart of religious life. And also, what are we as producers? When we talk about the passivity of considering yourself a consumer, we've almost lost the sense of ourselves as, as productive people, as people who in our working lives are actually responsible for what happens. And that is where we have much more responsibility. What we do at, at work has much more responsibility creates much more effect than wh whether we recycle our, our paper at home. And I think religion needs to take that up. Christianity is far more about what, what daily life is about and what we do on a daily basis and how we treat people and treat the earth than it is about just reflection on a Sunday morning. Well, I think, yeah, it's leading that examined life, whether it's whether it's business or anything else. Know what you're doing. Know the effect of your actions are. I had a chance to meet Michelle right before the, uh, this uh, talk, so I'm very interested in your question. Yeah. So my name is Michelle Lewis, and I'm a joint degree student at the School of Forestry in the Divinity School. And I've been looking at ways to connect underserved populations, primarily low-income communities, to the environment and how religion can be used to help do that. And the thing that I've come up with repeatedly in my research 
about the lack of engagement to the resource is lack of access or accessibility issues, which bring up issues of environmental and social justice. And so I'm wondering what your company is doing, who you're partnering with um, to address issues of access um, amongst underserved populations. Go ahead. Um, in the United States, we don't have much involvement. Um, in where we have, where, where people are sewing and making the goods, we are currently engaged in a program with uh, Fair Labor Association to both create uh, a living wage, uh, make that a standard, and also um, uh, to bring about the ideals of the fair trade movement, which takes some of the profit that ordinarily goes to the factory owner and takes it back into the community, so that, and that the workers actually decide what is done with those with those uh, uh, with that with that money. Uh, I think that's a you know that that that's about as much as I know about what we're doing now. So we are almost out of time, but I'm going to uh, ask if we're going to do two more questions, and I'm going to ask a very brief final question. If you could keep your questions quite brief. So thank you very much. My name is Tiffany. I was actually Yale class of 07 undergrad. Um, my parents own a, a ski shop in my town, and I grew up um, helping them sell Patagonia products, which I've always loved and been galvanized by the story and the narrative behind it, and I'm passionate about helping people connect their values with their purchasing behaviors. That said, one of the challenges that we face is that in our store, Patagonia products are pretty premium. They're a very high price, and they're kind of seen as for a niche consumer. Um, and my question is, within the current economic structure of our society, where there are externalities of cost, is it possible for companies who adhere to the checklist at the back of your book, for example, to sell their products to more mainstream consumers at a, at a price point which seems more competitive to them? Well, uh, I mean, in, in the stores that we sell to, like your store, we're the same price as North Face, we're the same price as Marmot, we're the same price as all our competitors. There's not that much difference. Um, I would never want to lower our quality standard to be able to sell to less wealthy people. Um, I mean, it's just, uh, I tell, you know, the poor can't afford cheap goods. Can or cannot? They cannot afford cheap goods. Instead of buying a blender at Costco for 1995, that as soon as you put some ice in there, it blows the motor out, then you've got to buy another one. We have to get into the attitude of, okay, I'm going to buy a blender that's going to last the rest of my life. I'm going to save up until I can afford it, until I can pay cash for it, and that's going to be it. And um, I mean, that's the way I run my life. I've never bought anything on time. I, I mean, I've had a mortgage, yeah, but uh, that's about it. I wait till, you know, I've always waited. I mean, I'm coming from a background of eating cat food when I was a young climber. And I gave a talk at Walmart one time to all the buyers at Walmart. And they warned me at Walmart that said, look, uh, make sure you get across to your uh, 1,200 buyers from Walmart. Get across to them that Patagonia is able to do all of these things, not because you're selling to wealthy, expensive things to wealthy people. You got to get it so you relate to everybody here. Because your average Walmart customer not only has no credit card. He has no checking account. Comes in with their welfare checks. So I gave a story. I said, look, you may think you know, that we're successful because we sell expensive products to rich people, but that's part of it. But I'll also sell to the dirtbag climber or skier or whatever who lives out of his van and 
they save up and when they do buy a jacket, they buy ours because it'll last a long, long time. It'll be multifunctional. It'll do what they expect it to do. And that's a big part of our customers. And when they go into a Walmart store to buy their cat food, like I used to, I didn't buy at Walmart, I used to buy from dented cat food, I mean dented can store. I'd buy cases of cat food. So when he goes to buy his cat food at Walmart, and the cat food is made in China and it's full of melamine, you're poisoning my customer. So what kind of value are you giving to your customer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> about the idea of the new economy and we talked about the importance of having connections with like-minded companies. I'd like to just circle back to the B Corporation concept, which you brought up but then I think got kind of lost in the shuffle. Um, Patagonia is a B Corporation. Um, has that been something that you consider significant to your company? Do you think that's a significant trend or does it merely reinforce what certain companies would do anyway, and I say this in the context that now it's becoming a legal entity in certain states. Well, I mean, to be brief, uh, a B Corp is a benefit corp, and it's like you're a farmer and you put your land in a conservation easement or a, a farming land trust that assures that your farm will never be developed, and it'll stay in agriculture forever. And that's what we've done by signing up as a B Corp. We've stated what our values are, and you can't change those values without 100% uh, agreement from the owners and the stockholders. So it takes a lot of pressure off of us because the system in America forces you to become a public company. If, if, if I wasn't a B Corp and died my wife and I died. Our, the stock is held in a trust, and the stock goes to an environmental foundation that we started. The, according to the law, the foundation can only hold 20% of any one company's stock. So they would have to divest 80% of the stock. And to be a responsible foundation, you'd have to sell it to the highest, for the highest value, which is to go public. You can imagine what we could get for if we went public as a company, because we're one of the most, I mean, we would make more money than Krispy Kreme did, which sold for 40 times earnings, uh, then crashed, of course. So uh, this allows us to, or future heirs or whatever, to continue the business with the same values puts in stone the same values that we operate now. And they wouldn't have to sell to the highest bidder. They, would have to, they could sell to private investors who believe in the same things that we do and want to maintain the same values. So it's been a, this B Corp is, is super important for us, but I think, you know, if, if the government really enforced the laws of corporations, there's a lot of corporations in America that would lose their charter, and that's never happened. All right, well, in wrapping up, I want to point out that we are in a very interesting time when, to draw on the Divinity School tradition, we now see certain extraordinary business leaders emerging as prophetic voices, uh, really raising fundamentally different uh, visions for the future, and that's a very valuable thing. I want to report to those of you here that a member of my team up in Boston said that the online chat is currently trending uh, Yvonne for president. So, no. so you I'm are too getting... short, too short to be president. <laughs> um, short people don't become president. So I, the, my final question to you is, and you're talking about companies, but I wonder about this institution. Um, you say, uh, when you're talking about in your chapter, where to from here, um, I'm interested in both of your uh, responses. You say, we advocate a combination of steady improvements with the occasionally breathtakingly bold move to keep everyone awake 
and motivated to show leadership that reflects well on everyone. So my question, since we are here, is what would be a breathtakingly bold move for Yale University? Well, if it was a few years ago, I would have said recycle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I mean, a few years ago, the last institutions to really get it were hospitals. Who serves the most unhealthy food in the world? <laughs> hospitals, right? <laughs> In Japan, you get out of a major operation and they feed you sashimi. We feed, you know, lime jello. <laughs> and the last ones to discover recycling were universities. And that's really simple. I mean, change the light bulbs. I don't know if these are LED bulbs or not, but they should be. Uh, it's very simple. Just look around and uh, go through the checklist. We, I went through the checklist for my own company and I came up to about 70%. We're doing about 70%. Um, well, there are all kinds of things. I think one thing, if, if, if Yale is having a discussion about the, the new economy or the next economy, it would be what would be the investment strategy of its uh, portfolio. I mean, it, you already see that it's already addressed a lot of questions about how it behaves in the community. <laughs> But uh, that would that would be a major that would be a major question for, for the university. I think I think, I, think uh, I, I was offered a, a fellowship here at Yale. Now I've, I've got a degree in auto mechanics from John Burroughs High School. But what they saw is the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies was teaching all these courses in environmental studies, and the School of Business was teaching business courses. But neither one was teaching. Um, the business school was not teaching anything about the responsibility to the planet. I gave a talk at Stanford a few years ago and uh, to a bunch of uh, grad students, uh, industrial designers, industrial engineering. And when I told them to include environmental considerations in their designs, they said no teacher had ever told, her, told them to do that. That was about six or seven years ago. There was a total disconnect between business and environmental responsibility, or the School of Forestry was cranking out students who were gonna go work for an environmental organization with no training in business. And they were gonna go up against, you know, teams of corporate attorneys with money from a bake sale. So the idea of combining the two is what we're trying to do at Patagonia. I just want to thank Dean Sterling. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank the Yale uh, Divinity School Advisory Board. Uh, this has been, and I especially want to thank uh, uh, President Schoenard and uh, <laughs> Vincent Stanley for uh, what I think has been an extremely illuminating conversation. And I hope it's the first of many. I know that you're going to continue to travel around and talk about this. And I hope that we will have more conversations uh, here at Yale. And I hope that the people who are watching online will stimulate, because I, I think we are, as you say so eloquently, we are at a moment where we both must and can start rethinking these basic questions. And I want to thank you on all of our behalf for taking leadership in action and then expressing it in this beautiful book. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.